So this is timeline. I think it's number 17. I don't really know, but it is final timeline number one. The dates for this, the first half of the year, let's put 1,400 all the way on the left. Very quickly, let's put 1,500. And then spread equally throughout the rest. Give me 16, 17, and... 1815. 1815 is our dividing line for this class. Why 1815? What happens in 1815? That's the Congress of Vienna. That's the midpoint of AP European history. All right. Now, if we had to pick the clusters for the entire first year of the uh, year of the class, what would you pick? There is an obvious answer first and foremost, but a big triangle with an X through it. And all of the steps on this timeline, we are going to be destroying one aspect of the old feudal system. We're going to go after the nobles, then we're going to go after the church, then we're going to go after the kings, and we'll eventually be done with the old-timey feudal system. The death knell of the feudal system is, for the most part, the French Revolution, right? When the old regime and the official first, second, third estate are all destroyed, and everybody becomes at least on paper equal. The other significant point for the early part of the year, I would put humanism. I think most of what we write about, we can argue, ties back to humanism, an idea that comes out initially during the Renaissance, but expands, um, uh, it, it hits all, all aspects of it. So let's hit uh, 1400s right in real small. Let's do a little box down here all the way over to the 1600s, and let's draw a line somewhat in the middle, a little bit about 1500, a little bit after it. Now, up here, we're going to put a really small dot, and the actual invention we're going to put on this timeline in the middle 1400s is the printing press. The printing press is going to impact most of these timelines going forward. There's a reason the printing press happens, and during slash then, all of Europe modernizes and enters a new era. This is, of course, the Renaissance. We're splitting the Renaissance into two parts. Uh, early on, 1400s in through the 1500s, we have the Italian. Sometimes it's called the High Renaissance. The Italian or the High Renaissance. Again, we're not going to put everything from that timeline on here. This is just an overview. But by far, uh, no, we know that the Italian Renaissance starts with the father of humanism, that is Francesco Petrarch. The word Renaissance itself means rebirth. In this case, it means a rebirth of Greek and Roman culture and literature. So Petrarch actually just simply rewrote um, a lot of the works of the old Romans and Greeks so that they can, the next generation can learn them in advance. The buzzwords for all of this, we're going to write down humanism. The idea that individuals have value, that ties in with um, education, that ties in with leadership, and that ties in, of course, with, um, uh, with uh, destroying the feudal system. How do we see humans having more importance in art? Depth and perspective are our two techniques. Now, early on, the subjects of religion, the subject of art is still heavily religious. Because in the early part of this renaissance, the only people with money is the church. Okay, So that is patronage. As we move further into the renaissance, it's not a coincidence that on another part of this timeline... The reason we do all of them at once is because you're going to see in 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. That's 20 years before uh, Michelangelo paints the Sistine Chapel. That's right about the time uh, Machiavelli is going to start uh, writing his book, right? These things overlap. One of the big things about exploration is more money uh, comes into the countries, right? And those monies enter the country through two jobs. What are those two jobs? Merchers and merchants and bankers, right? So we're developing the new elite. Eventually, this patronage, which starts as religious, becomes more secular. Secular is a key word, of course, meaning non-religious. The last word we're going to put on here is the gold star word. If you want to suck up to AP Euro teachers that are grading your essay, use the word Machiavellian. Machiavellian was a civic humanist. Uh, that means he focused on government. He writes a book called The Prince, which is essentially a how-to book on how to be a leader. And he doesn't pay attention much at all to using religion or divine, right? He says facts. If you do this, then, or if this happens, then you should do this. Now, eventually, the Renaissance does spread. It goes to the northern, 
sometimes called the late Renaissance. The primary difference between these two things is as the Renaissance moves out of Italy, that pure secular humanism mixes with religion and becomes Christian humanism. We learned about two different Christian humanists. One wrote a book called Utopia in, in 1516, living in England. His name was Thomas More. The other one was Erasmus. Education. Thank you. That's it for the Renaissance. Next scholar. You can keep a list up here if you want, but it mostly goes in order. Next color. The next thing we're going to do is the Reformation. The Reformation. We have an actual starting date for the Reformation. What is it? It is 1517. Give me uh, a little bit, about an inch block right here, if you write small. And we'll say it ends about 1600-ish, but really it ends in 1648, because 1648 was the end of the Thirty Years' War, and the Thirty Years' War was the last large-scale religious war. This is the Reformation. Now, once again, we're going to split the Reformation into two parts, but only put a little line right there, because I need the bottom. So, the early part of the Reformation is the Protestant. Protestant Reformation. Starts in 1517 when Martin Luther posts the 95 Theses on the doors of the church in Germany. Germany. Very good. The German region, which at this time is a part of the Holy Roman Empire. That's why the Holy Roman Empire is going to be the one hit biggest by the Protestant Reformation and the one that is going to fall um, apart. Uh, so, now, what was Martin Luther's biggest problem with the Roman Catholic Church? You're going to be wrong, but tell me your answer. It's not spin. It's anti-clericalism. Anti-clericalism, I want to write that down so you remember what it means. It primarily means clergy. It's against the clergy. Now, specifically, also a key concept, what were the reasons that he didn't like the Roman Catholic clergy, Joe? Spin. Spin, okay. Simony, pluralism, slash absenteeism, indulgences, and nepotism. We understand that. Now, he cuts the uh, Catholic Church pretty deeply, and a whole lot of people leave, about a third of Europe. Eventually, the Catholic Church responds. That's called the Catholic sometimes the Counter-Reformation. And what is the event of the Catholic slash Counter-Reformation? Council of Trent. In the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic Church does two things. A, they stop the bleeding, right? How do you stop the bleeding and stop people from becoming Protestants? You use censorship. Specifically, they publish the Index of Prohibited Books that bans a lot of Protestant works. After you stop the bleeding, what do you need to do? inject more blood into your body. So they create religious orders. Missionary is a fair word, but they'll use the term religious orders. Of all of them, the most famous are the Jesuits. Founded by Ignatius Loyola, there is also the Ursuline Order of Nuns and St. Teresa of Avila. Now, in this, there is, in 1555, we'll put the date just for funsies, the first real strike that gives Protestantism full reality, legality, it's going to stick around for a while, is in the Holy Roman Empire, and it's the Peace of Augsburg. Peace of Augsburg is the first document where a country says, all right, fine, you can be Protestant. The other thing that we put in the Reformation, because that's where she fits, is Queen Elizabeth. Again, not memorizing her dates, but she dies in 1603. This is Elizabeth I. We could write a dozen things under her, but to review, she's significant for three reasons. Number one, she is, a, she is quote, the nickname. Virgin queen. She is a woman that doesn't marry, therefore um, keeps her power uh, and rules as a singular woman monarch in Europe. Two, in 1588, she defeats these evil Catholic armada of Spain uh, with the Spanish wind. And thirdly, most significantly, she provides religious stability. As a Protestant leader, she calms down the Catholics and the Anglicans, which are Protestants, condemns all violence, and that stability is what allows England to pretty quickly survive the English Civil War and then thrive when the rest of Europe is failing. Since they thrive in this area, they go into the Ag Rev, they go into the Industrial Rev, they go into imperialism better than anybody else 
for almost the rest of this class. That is the it for the Reformation. Next color, if you want. This will be exploration. Um, this is the last thing on our top left. So let's put exploration. I'm going to put it like all the way over here, about 1400. And I'm going to go over to uh, into the 1600s. There's no defined end date, but exploration. Let's split that into three columns. So first up for early exploration, what was the first country involved? Portugal. The second country was Spain. The third country was the Dutch, the Netherlands. What's their company? The Dutch East India Company. And then after the Dutch, who shows up? The big boys, France and England. Since Portugal is first, we're not going to write down Portugal. Here we're instead going to write what? Henry the Navigator. Henry the Navigator is in many ways considered the patron of exploration. He is the guy who finances these trips. Portugal would benefit the most by finding a trade route to the Indian Ocean where all the goods are that they want. The biggest impact of Henry and his patronage is the fact that uh, Portugal develops a whole bunch of sailing technology. You know all of them, but what's the most important one? The Caravel. We also have the Latine rig, the stern post rudder, the magnetic compass, the astrolabe, and even the portolani, which are the journals of explorers, which now with the printing press and everything else, a whole lot more people can read and inspires the next generation of explorers to go and explore. What is the primary motivation of these early Spanish and Portuguese explorers especially? God, glory, and gold. The three Gs. We talked about Hernan Cortez, Pizarro, the conquest of Africa. We know the Treaty of Tordesilla is where Spain and Portugal had to settle their differences. So the ultimate point of exploration is that they are trying to get to the Indian Ocean for things like silk and spices because that's where the money is. But once we explore the world, once we pass 1492, the center of trade in the world goes from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic. The Atlantic becomes the center of trade. <coughs> As the Atlantic is becoming the center of trade, after 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That exchange of goods between the old world and the new is called the Columbian Exchange. Within the Columbian Exchange, some goods went from the old world to the new. What goods went from the old world to the new? Smallpox number one. If you didn't know it, write it down there, okay? That's by far the number one that they ask about. And livestock, those are the two, but smallpox is the big one. What goods came from the new world to the old? Corn, Corn and potatoes, and what's the cash crop? Tobacco. Tobacco is going to be a part of the triangle trade, which is slavery. Initially, slavery in the New World was all Native Americans. The problem is all those Native Americans died because of smallpox. Very good. So Europeans shifted to the triangle trade. Now, what did the slaves do in the New World? They worked two jobs. Number one, they worked in mines, harvesting gold and silver. And number two, they worked on harvesting sugar. Sugar, sugar, sugar is the answer, okay? It will always be the answer. So, the other side of this, the uh, outcome of the Age of Exploration is rivalry. Right? Rivalry leads to competition of claiming more and more land and colonies, and claiming more and more land and colonies will lead to war. Do you know what the war is? Right here is the Seven Years' War. Considered by some to be the first true world war because it was essentially fought over Europe, but really over colonies. It's a good sign of how this all takes. Now, we do get a new economic system. Once we have colonies that we can buy and sell goods with, what's our next economic system as we enter the 1600s? It's mercantilism. What name do you think of when I say mercantilism? No. It is... Colbert, who was the finance minister for Louis XIV. He built a huge, huge route. Now, you can think of Adam Smith. I think that's a valid answer. But what do you need to say about that? 
he comes up with the with the system that is in response to mercantilism. Adam Smith is writing in the um, Enlightenment, and he comes up with instead of government controlled colonies and trade, we should have a pure free trade market. Right. Um, and the last thing is a lot of that new money goes to a new elite class. They play a role all over the place. The new elite, you see where they are here on this timeline? The new elite are buying artwork in the 1500s and 1600s. That's why we can get more secular artwork. The new elite are buying things like The Prince, a secular book. The new elite are adopting Protestantism because now they don't have to pay a whole bunch of money to the Roman Catholic clergy. And the new elite are obviously going to be intendants during the, absolute, uh, during the uh, age of absolutism. And they play a huge role as a part of the... Uh, National Assembly in uh, the French Rev. Next. Oh, their jobs, by the way, were bankers and merchants. They might put that next color. Next color is... I don't want orange. Blue. Absolutism. To be clear, as you come to the last day or two, if you want to review anything at home because you're feeling slightly uh, motivated, number one, watch the Enlightenment timeline. The Enlightenment is always on the AP test. And number two, watch the Absolutism timeline because you already know it well. So let's crush it when you get an essay, a DBQ, or a short answer question on those people. For Absolutism, we're going to put it right here in the 1600s. You can give me a little box, uh, a, little, a little like this. It's going to end when? Not an Uber date, but I've, seven, I've said it enough in the last month. 1715 is the death of Louis XIV. So in your mind, it is the beginning of the end of absolutism. This is absolutism. Okay. All right. So let's draw a kind of line down the center, just so I have two things, but leave a whole space in the bottom right here. The most famous absolute monarch of all time is Louis the XIV, Louis the Fourteenth. How does he become an absolute monarch? First off, if you ever write down Louis the Fourteenth, you might very well write his nickname down, which is the Sun King Joe, which shows you already said it. Divine right, right? Uh, so we get divine right. He uses the palace of Versailles to get the nobles under his control. He finds different ways to raise taxes. He creates what kind of army? A professional army, which is all organized under his larger centralized bureaucracy. He hires intendants. He hires the new elite to be intendants to overcome the nobles. And he never calls the... The Estates General. Very good. The, all right. The other guy on this list is Peter the Great. Peter the Great is known as the Great Westernizer. How does he westernize? There's three things. He shaves the beards, which shows his power over religion. And number two, he builds St. Petersburg, which A, acts as a, a palace of Versailles for the nobles to control them, and B, acts as a warm water port, so they've opened up trade and communication with the West. The other buzzwords for these guys are centralize. Centralize the triangle with the star at the top. Do you remember the triangle with the star at the top? Was? Bureaucracy. We're making government bigger so that we can house all of government. And the other one, we can't do any timeline about these guys without writing down divine rights. Now, in the age of absolutism, not all countries went to absolutism. One country went to constitutionalism. England, because they already have a very set government, because they already signed the Magna Carta way before this timeline even started, they had, uh, you notice right here, Queen Elizabeth dies, so we end up with who? The Sturts, James Charles, Charles James. They were big jerks. They tried to become absolute monarchs. They tried to not car a parliament, and it ends up with the English Civil War. During the English Civil War, Thomas Hobbes is writing a book called Leviathan, where he says, life without rules is nasty, brutish and, short, brutish and short. We should just have an absolute monarch that runs everything because people are awful. Luckily for us in the world, it ends, though, with the Glorious Revolution. Glorious Revolution is a peaceful exchange of power. The last Stuart King... 
abdicates. He steps down from power and runs away, and they bring in William and Mary Orange to rule. And the very first thing that they sign is the English Bill of Rights. Again, a century ahead of the rest of Europe. They get through their troubles quickly and move on to agricultural, rav, industrial, rav, and dominating the planet. Oh, I also put professional army on this, but it's okay if you don't write it down. Next color is ag rev. You can use all the rest of the space in the top right here to do the agricultural revolution. There's a lot right here, but it's fair. First off, we know that at the end of this, when we get to the uh, 1800s, we are ending up with the Industrial Revolution. That's where all of this is heading. So at the beginning of this, again, this really, this, this goes on for a long time, the thousand years beforehand, but what kind of society do we live in? An agrarian society, which has a feudal social and political structure and uses what type of farming? No, uh, good answer, not the one. Subsistence. Subsistence farming, we talk about communal land. Everybody needs to farm all the land because farming is so primitive. Primitive. If you don't do that, they'll die. But everything changes as we get into the ag rev in the 1600s and into the 1700s. All right? Because of the changes to the agricultural revolution, we have things like a better three-crop rotation. Why do we suddenly have better crops to put in a three-crop rotation? Because in 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue, so by 1600, we are growing those crops. What's the most famous one? Beans. Beans, in this case, because it replenishes the soil with nitrogen. We also have things like the seed drill, and we also have things like uh, manure as fertilizer. Since we have better farming practices, we now end up with commercialized farming. Once you can make money doing something, who gets involved? The rich people, and what do they do? Enclosure. And we do highlight that this helps the elites, right? The nobles buy all the land so that they can run it. Because of enclosure, and because people are now losing their jobs, because farming is more efficient, we end up with the fancy schmancy word of proletarianization. Proletarianization means that people have become landless wage earners. All right. Now, the outcomes of all of this, the last column over here, is since they are landless wage earners, over the course of the late 1700s into the 1800s, they are going to move to the cities. That is urbanization. Because of this rapid urbanization, we have a whole bunch of problems in the cities. What were the problems in the cities? Sanitation. Everybody was dying of what disease? Cholera. Cholera. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a crime and whatnot. It's all because of overcrowding. What's the overall fix to this? More structure and more things. That all comes from government. The government's going to take a bigger role in cities. And what are the specific fixes? Sewage systems, they might say sanitation, but sewage and water, what? Police will fix the crime. What's the best fix, though? If the problem is overcrowding, we need public transportation to spread the cities out, okay? We also end up with a market economy, economy that's based on the buying and selling of goods. That's better than an agrarian society because if everything you buy, you have to trade in ears of corn. You're just not going to buy that much. But now with money, you're better, and this leads to a commercial revolution, meaning things can now be bought and sold much better. Population changes during this time. That's great. Uh, it, you know the, uh, the most significant number is the infant mortality rate. But the infant mortality rate drops, so the population rises. Quality of life gets better. Life expectancy gets better. Last color, please. This is the age of reason. I want you to leave a little bit of space at the end. There is one section at the end. It's the French Rev. For this, though, it is the age of reason. The age of reason is a dumb term that I don't really use, but what matters for the age of reason is that there's essentially two parts to it, right? Over here, we have the scientific 
revolution. The scientific revolution is all about faith to reason. I would write faith to reason above the age of. It's all about faith to reason. People start using the scientific method to decide life. That is the scientific method instead of faith. Okay? It's based on observation, empiricism, not feelings, not anything. We looked at two sciences specifically. One was astronomy. For astronomy, we used to use the old Aristotle geocentric model of the universe, but now we are using the new Copernican heliocentric model. We also note Galileo, who uses the telescope and challenges the church. And the end of all of this, of course, is Isaac Newton, who said our laws of gravity are the same laws applied to us or an apple from a tree and the moon in the sky. Everything is an integrated system. The other science we looked at was physiology. The physicians looked at the human body. We moved on from the old Galen system of the body, which we were made up of, the four humors, and we moved to a more integrated system. We had Vesalius wrote on the structure of the human body, but we all know Harvey Hart. And all of this was possible because of patronage. We have that new elite that wants to spend money on these people. Maybe it's because they want to get their names on a really great new invention, or maybe it's because they believe strongly in astronomy or, a, or no, excuse me, in astrology or what's the other one? Alchemy. Very good. All right. On the other side, for the Enlightenment, what we are doing in general is we are going to apply reason, underline reason, and the scientific method, underline the scientific method, to politics, and society. Scientific revolution applied the scientific method to uh, humans and the world and universe. The Enlightenment applies it to politics and society. Okay, They split them up into two groups. Number one, the philosophs. The philosophs in France are the most famous because France is kind of in its heyday coming out of Louis XIV. Even though England is, is uh, getting some stability, Louis XIV makes France the richest and most influential. Everybody reads their books. So we end up with people like Voltaire, whose critical targets are the kings and the nobles and the priests. And that's why he ends up in jail. We end up with Diderot, who wrote the... Encyclopedia and Rousseau, who comes later, and he's weird. The other people will put government thinkers. The government thinkers are most famously John Locke, who comes first and writes that since people are born as a blank slate, they deserve natural rights simply by being born. And we have Montesquieu and his three um, branches of government. Where, how do we talk about these Enlightenment ideas? How do they spread? Well, the literacy, print media, we have newspapers, pamphlets, everything like that. But most famously, salons are where it's discussed, along with coffee houses. And finally, not all of Europe gets the Enlightenment. In the East, they can't really adopt all of these Enlightenment principles because they're still stuck in the feudal system. So instead, they get enlightened monarchs. The, the, uh, the characteristics of an enlightened monarch are things like freedom of religion, less censorship, no torture. Let's bring about some education. I can do this. Oh, I have four minutes. Plenty of time. Super duper pooper last color. French Rev. French Rev, what is our date? 1789, okay. Up top, let's write the causes. Let's write this real small. The causes of the French Rev are three things. Number one, it is the three estates. The three estate system in France actually gets its own key concept name. It's called the old regime or sometimes called the ancien regime. It looks like the ancient regime. That is the definition of the feudal system. First estate clergy, second estate nobility, third estate everybody else. That works when it's an agrarian societal society, but not when everyone else includes urban poor, lawyers, doctors, and teachers. All right. The other reason, the real reason it starts is you remember why the king... The king calls the estates general for the first time in a hundred years. Why does he call the estates general for the first time in a hundred years? Because they're in debt. 
Guys, fighting wars are really expensive. You can get away with it as long as you win. But at the very end of Louis XIV's rule, he fought a war and lost. The War of Spanish Succession. Then we have the biggest and most expensive war in, in European history so far, the Seven Years' War, which France definitely does not win. So they're in a lot of debt. The king needs to get more taxes. And the first and second estate are only going to tax the third estate. The last spark that starts all great revolutions is famine. There's a bread riot right there. Now, there are three stages of the French Rev. We're only going to list a, a point or two for, for most. The first one is called the liberal phase. So they all get together at the Estates General. They realize that the Estates system is broken. So the third estate marches out and they form the National Assembly. The National Assembly gets locked out. They sign the tennis court oath, but eventually they become legitimate. Before, if the purpose of government is to protect the natural rights, before you make government, you have to declare the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Put a star by that. That is the single most enlightened document we talk about. That is great context and great evidence. If you talk about anything in the 16 or 17 or 1800s involving government, you should mention that somewhere in your essay or DBQ. And the actual Constitution is the Constitution of 1791. This, again, the liberals don't want to change everything, so they create a constitutional monarchy. Now, the king tries to run away, so we end up with the radical phase. The radical phase has Robespierre, it has the Mountain, it has the Jacobins, it has uh, the Committee of Public Safety, but ultimately it's all about the reign of terror. The reign of terror, the rest of Europe is now uh, super angry at France because they killed a divine right king, and they're really angry because they're terrified that Enlightenment ideals could spread. And that brings about Napoleon and the Napoleon, um, the Napoleon section of it all. Napoleon's good for a bunch of reasons, bad for a bunch of reasons. If you don't know, French Rev timeline, absolutism timeline, Enlightenment timeline. Thank you.